welcome to church. My name is Courtney, and I'm going to tell you about everything happening this week at River City. If this is your first time worshiping with us, welcome. We are so glad you're here, and we'd love to get to know you. If you go to our website, you can click the I'm New button, fill it out, or meet us at the Info Hub. We cannot wait to meet you. is step four of first steps. If you're new to River City, this is where you learn all about us and find your place here. Meet us 15 minutes after the 11 a.m. service. Child care is provided. VBS is June 19th through the 21st from 6 to 8 p.m. Registration for this event closes on June 16th. Don't miss out on sending your kids to this awesome event. weekend is June 15th at the Hennigan venue. Don't miss out guys on a crawfish boil, some cornhole, and some fellowship. Be there at 6 p.m. Don't miss out. <laughs> Baby dedications are going to be June 23rd in the 11 a.m. service. Don't forget to go online and register your child for this event. so much for worshiping with us today. You can stay connected by following us on all of our social media or our website. Now can everyone please stand and give God a hand clap of praise. What has God been good to you today? Come on, somebody shout out a hallelujah! Yeah! Highest word of praise, and I love to say it. Sometimes it's just, just a time where you just got, I don't know what else to say, but hallelujah, because he's a good God. It's good to see you there this morning, and, and man, if it's your first time with us here at River City, it's great to have you here today. We hope you enjoy yourself. Come on, boy. it's good to, good, to, good to see you guys. <laughs> We're starting to say our services are starting to even out. We used to have a full room in the second service, and the first it was a little sparse. Well, this morning we had about this many people in our first one, and so it, it's it's fun. If you ever get a chance to catch an early service, it's a good one. It's a good one too, and we have a great time. But uh, it's great to see you guys here, all my late my my non morning people. I appreciate you. I'm with you. I'm not a morning person myself, uh, but but we we're here, amen. And so and you're starting off the week right. This is the way to start your week off. So you can be seated everywhere today. I got a few things to cover before I jump into the Word this morning. Uh, number one, this week's a big week. This next weekend is Men's Weekend. You do not want to miss it. We have a, we already have a lot signed up for it. You want to go ahead and get signed up for it yourself. Um, it, it's a great opportunity. Last year we had a guest speaker, and it was fun. And, and but this year we said, you know what? We're just going to spend time together. Uh, I may talk about ten to fifteen minutes, which means about thirty to forty-five minutes, but. Anyway, no, I'm just kidding. But uh, I'm just going to speak briefly on fellowship and the, the power of relationships with other men and, and, and having, having, that sh- having that iron to sharpen on iron. Amen. I, I, love, I love having real men in my life, strong men in my life, because a, a real man will look at you and tell you the truth whether you want to hear it or not. I appreciate that. I, I really do. Sometimes it hurts a little, but sometimes that's the way it needs to be because it straightens some things out in our lives. And I, I don't know about you. I want to be better. I don't want to be the same old person. I want to be who God's called me to be. And so it's good to build those relationships with other men in the church body. That's $15 a person. And, guys, we're going to have a good time playing some beanbag toss or cornhole, whatever you want to call it. Uh, then we're going to, I think, we, I don't think, I know for a fact, we're going to have one of my favorite delicacies. And you call it a delicacy because it really is. Is and it's crawfish. I don't know about you guys, but I like a good crawfish bowl. So they said, how much, how much crawfish should we prepare for for each man? And somebody said, maybe like a pound or two or five pounds. I said, heck, no, I'm going to eat 20 myself. Like, man, I, I, I tear up some crawfish. Somebody said, I don't eat bugs. I said, well, I was over in Asia one time, and we were in Chinatown, Yangon, Myanmar, and and, um, and that guy come down the middle 
of the street. Of course, it's not much of a street, you know, because it's so, you know, it's, that city's thousands of years old. And, and so it, they're coming down through there, and a guy's got a cart with, with uh, grasshoppers on it. Anybody here ever eaten any grasshoppers before? Where are you at? That's, there you go. I'd say. And, and now, now, see, we, we buy the grasshoppers here or crickets here, and the, they're in the little pickled crickets, or you can get sweet and spicy, you know. And nobody really eats it for real. Over there, they have grasshoppers that are that long when they're hanging off the... And, and uh, I said, man, who eats that mess? And he laughed. He said, me. And he bought some, and he cried. <laughs> and then I started going, oh, dad, gum. He said, don't you... Uh, this is Elvis. He said, don't you lie, sucker. You know you eat crawfish. That's a bug, too. He wasn't wrong. He wasn't wrong. <laughs> so we're going to have a good time eating crawfish and, and uh, some new potatoes and some corn and some, all that kind of stuff. It's, it's going to be fun. Don't miss it, guys. It starts at 5 o'clock on Saturday out at the Hennigan, Hennigan venue. You need to sign up for it, though. I think, I think sign-ups end like Wednesday or Thursday. And so you can go on our website, sign up for that so that we know we're prepared our food uh, based on, on how many people we have signed up. We just want, we want you there. If you can't pay for it, just go sign up anyway. We'll figure that out. Amen. Because we, we want you there. It's important that you're there. Also, coming up next couple of weeks, but this morning we saw a group of people off, put them on a charter bus and sent them to Arkansas, to uh, Hot Springs, Arkansas for youth camp. All right, man, I'm pumped about that because I know some kids are going to come back fired up. Y'all believe that? Come on, man. We need to pray for them this week. So we have a little empty hole over here, and we have some empty spots around the room because our, we have about... Uh, 30 or 40 people on a charter bus headed out of here right now, and they're going to youth camp and having a good time today. We sent them off this morning early. And, uh, and the reason I brought that up is because we also have VBS coming up in a couple of weeks. Come on, that's exciting. And I know it's going to be, we, we're looking forward to a big year. We have a lot of people planning on coming already. And, um, and I know those kids that are at youth camp are going to be serving in VBS. I love it that way. When I was a youth pastor, we used to go to youth camp, and then the next week would be VBS, and we were guaranteed great help. You know why? Because they'd been away for a week getting in the presence of God, and then they'd come back to VBS, and it'd, it'd come off of them on all those little kids. Ain't that beautiful, man, getting to see? Come on, man. That's a beautiful thing to see. It's a beautiful thing to see. And so, uh, you know, we, we keep them in your prayers and then get your kids signed up for VBS. It's a three-night VBS this year. We're not doing a full week. We're just kind of getting our feet back in the water. We used to do these every year, and they were phenomenal. And I know this year it's going to be fun. I, I think I've been volunteered to be a part of a play on the last night. I hope it's something goofy. That's all I, because I like doing goofy stuff. Amen. So look at your neighbor and tell them you look great this morning. You looking good. Careful who you say it to, though. We're going to have a good time today. Today, um, or this week, I, I, I was getting the message ready, and I didn't know I was going to title it, because uh, it's going to be a series for a couple weeks. And, and um, I, it hit me Friday night. I was sitting in a church service in, in East Texas, and it hit me. I mean, it hit me out of nowhere. How to be a follower. Now, that is a real aspirational and inspirational concept. Because we live in a world where everybody wants to tell you how to be a leader, right? But nobody is telling you how to be a follower. And I know when I say that, somebody's like, I don't want to be a follower. Uh, we all want to be leaders. There's a lot of people leading, and, and they're trying to lead somebody, but they ain't leading nobody but themselves. Uh, since the age of internet and social media, there's a lot of people leading people that should not be leading people. You know, that, come on, let's be honest about it. And a lot of people follow them because they affirm things in their life that God does not affirm or those types of things. And it gets them sideways. It gets people confused. And it happens in the church body a lot. There's a lot of, there's a lot of call out kings and call out queens in the world, but they don't actually serve in the body of Christ anywhere. But they got a social media site and they got a YouTube channel. And they're creating discord in the body of Christ. But see, today I want to talk to you, and for the next couple of weeks, I want to talk to you about how to be a follower, how to be a follower. That's not very fun, I know. I, I, I started going back to the gym. I got a garage gym, you know, white, uh, you know, power rack set up and everything in my garage, but it's starting to get hot, and I told my wife, I said, I'm not doing this another year. It's been six years since I've had a gym membership at my favorite gym, and I've been trying to work out, and summertime goes around, and I work out like once a week during the summertime because it's so dead gum hot. 
And uh, I'm getting old, man. I, I can't do that 100 degrees. And uh, I mean, I just can't do it anymore. And um, I, so I went and got my membership at Underground Performance. It's my favorite. There's a lot of strong men competitors and, and power lifters there. And I, I love being around that crowd of guys. They're a fun group of guys. And a lot of them are Christians. And they, they, they write scriptures up on the wall. Oh, Joel, the guy that owns it, he lets them write stuff up there. And they'll, they'll write inspirational quotes. And, and one of them I wrote up, uh, they wrote up there the other day. It said, lead... Follow or get out of the way. Lead, follow, or get out of the way. So there's a lot of folks, they hear that, and when they do, they say, well, let me just get out of your way. That's not the goal of the quote. <laughs> Lead, follow, or get out. In other words, if you get out of the way, you're not involved in what's going on. We believe that we are called into this city to be a man in the arena or woman in the arena church. What do you mean? We're not just critics on the outside looking in. We're in the middle of it. We're involved in it. What what are we involved in? What the kingdom of God is doing in this earth. And today I'm going to challenge some thought processes. And we're going into summertime. And and, and, and I'm kind of i going to open up today with a concept and an idea here. That I know that when we go into summertime, a lot of times people have the tendency to fall back a little bit. And if we're not careful, we'll fall back and fall out. And I want to encourage you, do not fall out of God's will for your life. My dad preached a lot about it when I was a kid. I don't know if you realize this, but we live in one of the most, most blessed nations in the world. With all that we're facing in the world and all the turmoil and economic issues we're facing, we're still one of the greatest blessed, great, one of the most blessed nations on this planet. And I find in Revelations chapter 3, a church is talked to, and it's Revelations 3 and 15 through 16 is what I'm reading today, said, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. You're neither cold nor hot. He says, I wish you were one or the other. He said, because you're lukewarm. You're neither cold nor hot. Neither hot nor cold. He said, because of this, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. In other words, you're not going to be in the body. You're not going to be a part of me anymore. I, I, I don't want that. Now, this is God speaking through John the Revelator. I, I know. I know, man. I, I was so excited. I had these ideas. I was going to come in and teach you some cool theological points and and try to show how smart I was. I'm not really smart. I just have uh, concordances. <clears throat> what does that mean? That means I go and I use that concordance. Matthew Henry, what can you tell me about this passage of Scripture? Right? Tell me some stuff. I, I, I love doing that stuff and, and teaching those concepts. But I find that we do that a lot more in Logos. We, we break things down a little bit more in Logos. But, but I just feel like God has just kept leading me to keep poking and prodding. And just keep poking and keep prodding. And today, I'm here to say, make a point to you going into this summer, be careful that we do not become the church of Laodicea. They were rich and increased with goods, and they had need of nothing. And if we're not careful, we'll come to church on Sundays, we'll be partially involved, we were hot when we first got in, and then we get to a point where we've been in for a while and we become experts in church. This is usually when you start cooling down a little bit and you get a little lukewarm, and then you become a church critic is what happens. And before long, we're no longer involved in what's going on. We're no longer setting the room temperature. We're not being thermostats, but we're being thermometers. And I want to tell you this morning, God has called you to more than being a thermometer. I, I told Brad Allen uh, last week, he was gone for a week. They were away for, and got away for their anniversary and spent some time together. And I, I think that's awesome, man. You get, get away, man. Go take some weekends off and spend some time with you, with your better half. That's your better half, right, Brad? Exactly. That's the better half. That's uh, all men. Just get a hold of something. She's the better half. Amen. And um, and I told him something when he got home. I said I could feel your absence in the room. And I, I said I realized something about you, Brad. And I please, I don't mean to embarrass him. And he probably he don't pre, he don't like it when you do this kind of stuff. But you're a thermostat in the room, dude. You set the temperature in a room. Just your presence in a sanctuary on a Sunday morning when I'm preaching, man. It just feels like you're you you just set the pace. There's people that do that. D, you're all right too. But anyways. 
But no, I, you, you just have people sometimes that, that they're thermostats. They're not just there to, to, to what's, the, what's the wind, is changes doing? What's, no, no, they're there, they're hold of God, and they lead by example. And the reason they're leading by example is because they're following the example. And this is where I'm at this morning with this concept, and I'm going to get into a little bit more here in a minute. We have to be careful that we do not become too comfortable and complacent in living for God. And through going into the summertime, I want to encourage you, pay attention. Keep, keep focused on what matters. Because God said, I don't want you to be hot or cold, or I don't want you to be lukewarm. I want you to either be hot or cold. Some of my favorite people coming into the church are people who don't know anything about church. They just know they need Jesus. They're not experts on everything. We have plenty of critics in the world. We don't need any more crit- critics. We need people who want Jesus in their lives. Is there anybody here that says, I want Jesus in my life? <laughs> now, I, show of hands here. I can't see real good up here because got, I got lights in my face. But I can see some silhouettes out there. So if you're mad at me, I can't, I can't tell anyway. It don't, get over it. I can't see that. You, if, you're giving me, if you're giving me ugly looks, praise God. God bless you. Bless your heart. So, you know, I, I can't really say good, but I can see some hands if you lift them. Who, who here likes, in the, in the hot summertime, I've gotten a hold of something, and it's, it's cold brew coffee. Anybody here like some cold brew coffee? Look at you. That's my cold brew. Man, it's too hot outside. I ain't drinking no hot coffee. But, man, when that temp starts going down, where's my hot coffee, people? Where's my hot coffee? But awesome, awesome, awesome. Now, I got a question for you this morning. Is there anybody here that likes lukewarm room temperature coffee? The, there's always one. There's two in this one. There's one person in the last one. We got two people in this, in this service right here. They like the room temperature coffee. I don't know about you, but when I taste it in this room temperature, I'm not too excited about it. My wife likes to go, she likes to go to, uh, to, to, the, to the store or to the restaurant and she, she'll tell them, give me this sweet tea or give me something like that. And she'll tell them, no ice. And I, I don't understand, no ice. What is wrong with you, lady? No ice. Man, I, I like to have some, like I, I want some good, some good ice in my, in, my, in my, I want it cold. That's how it's supposed to be. But the fact of the matter is, if we're not careful, we start coming to church and we get used to being comfortable and complacent. And we get lukewarm. God said, I, I, I'd, I'd rather you be completely, I, I'd rather you know nothing about me coming in, know nothing. And, and this is, again, again, this is back to the get, lead, follow, get out of the way. Another saying is get in, get out, or get run over. You ever heard that one before? I say that one constantly at my house because little girls have a tendency they step right in front of you when you're walking somewhere and they walk as slow as possible so I tell them get in get out or get run smooth over it kid all right I will pick them up move them if I have to what are you talking about the goal of this is not this message talking about being hot or cold the goal is not for you to get to a place where you just get out that's not the goal don't get out of the way no engage in what God is wanting to do. See, because there's a couple of things that, that can happen if we're not careful. The peril, there's perils to spiritual complacency. And we find that in the book of Revelation. See, Jesus warns the church of Laodicea about the danger of becoming lukewarm in their faith. If we're not careful, we get to a place where we're lukewarm in our faith. I'm, I'm just here, I'm filling a spot on the pew. But in, this is my spot, right? This is my spot. Y'all ever been to church somewhere, show of hands, where you sit down, you were a guest, and someone looked at you and said, you're sitting in my seat. Anybody ever been there before? You're sitting in my seat. Uh, we we kind of got there one time, and, and a couple years ago, I asked Dad. I was not senior pastor yet, so I had to ask permission. Now I'm just going to do it when I want to. But anyways... I, I, I said, Dad, it's okay if I do this. We come in on Sunday morning. I said, well, everybody stand up. Everybody stood up. I said, go ahead and collect your belongings. Somebody heard Dad says, he about to kick us out of here? Was he about to? I said, go ahead and collect your stuff up. Get in your hands. And y'all, some of y'all might remember. I said, this side, you're going to move to this side of the church. This side of the church is going to move to this side of the church. And they did. They moved, and people were looking around confused. They didn't know what was going on. Why is he doing this? Because by God, if you won't move, I'm going to make you move. Come on, my God, if you won't get up and do something, look at that. My God, there's a revival in this church. Someone just walked across the room. 
Praise God. Man, look at that. Look at that. Why? Because I stirred you up a little bit. I got you mixed up a little bit. Why? Why? Because that's my job. I'm a sheepdog. And see, it's my job to make sure you don't get complacent. It, like, I mean, I'd be a horrible leader if I did not nudge you every once in a while. I'd say, hey, listen, don't fall asleep. Don't fall asleep. This is not the time to fall asleep. He, so Jesus is warning the church of Laodicea about the dangers of becoming lukewarm in the faith. You see, the fact is when we grow too comfortable, we risk becoming indifferent to the things of God. See, sometimes we'll, we'll sit around a church for a long time, we'll get to a point where I know better, and, and you know, I know that scripture says that, but, my, I like the old saying, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Either the word of God is true, or it is not. And I choose, the word of God is true, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. God, your word is true, and I will follow your word. Because first, I choose to be a father. See, when you just get a hold of that concept, I was telling my wife yesterday, we live in a society that wants to know why. Everybody asks why. As a parent, don't you love it? Look, show of hands, you love it when your kid says why. Mm, mm, mm. That's where another comes saying, because I said so. I don't need to tell you why I said do it, right? Because I said. We got a world of people who are looking for why so much to the point they read books on why, 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 why that they never take a step and do the what. And I told my wife the other day, sometimes people need to get a hold of just do the what and the why will take care of itself. Like what would happen if somebody just said, well, the word of God says it. I don't know why it says it, but it says it. So if it says it, I'm going to do it. I choose the word of God and its truth. It is the truth of my life. It is the foundation of my life. And I may not understand all the whys yet, but I know God is eventually. Come on, man. That's a good point. Yeah? That's a good one. Anyways, there are a lot of people just need to get the why, and then God's going to fill in the why. I'm not telling you you don't need to know the why. You need to know your word. I'm going to get to that in a second. But the fact of the matter is, there's just a lot of people that never take the step forward because we're too busy focusing in on, we, we, we get too anxiety riddled over time. See, just this lukewarm water lacks the refreshing qualities of cold water, the soothing qualities of hot water. Lukewarm faith lacks the passion and the zeal necessary for true discipleship, or you could say followership. And if we're not careful, we'll get to a place to where we're just dead and we're okay with sitting on a pew and growing lukewarm. I, I don't know about y'all, but when I'm working in the heat, I enjoy ice cold, right? What's better than being cool? Ice cold. All right, all right, all right, all right. Hey, lady. Anyways. See, the fact of the matter is, is sometimes I think about working summer times with my granddad. He's here this morning, and he owned a company, and we'd, we, we'd work, you know, as before the child labor laws. I was about nine or ten, and he stuck a sharpshooter in my hand. That was good for me. I needed that. Amen? And so, but he paid me, too, though. He paid me pretty good, man. I, I remember I'd get a paycheck sometimes, but, like, man, Chris, what are you going to do with that paycheck? I told you all a couple weeks ago, I'm going to Army, Navy, surplus, and buying as much junk as I can get. I was pumped about it. I was pumped. Lufkin had one, had a, had a, had a Normie Navy. I'd drive him nuts. He'd walk in there. He's old Vietnam. Vet. He'd walk in there. Who wants this junk? Me, right? I got two helmets. I got a World War II helmet and a, and a Vietnam helmet in storage somewhere. I won't let the girls touch it. Why? I don't know. It's mine. My God, man, you're 40 years old. Don't touch my, my stuff, right? My stuff. My mom says, you are a hoarder. I'm like, I am not. I'm a collector. Then my wife says, hoarder. But I remember working with him in the summer times. Poppy had an old igloo cooler, and that sucker every morning, he'd fill that sucker up with ice. Remember Poppy? He'd put the water in that thing. It wasn't filtered water. It was out of a water hose. I got all the BPAs and plastics in my system, amen? And it got in there, man, I, and I remember, man, it'd get hot in East Texas, and it'd it, it get, it get humid. Cody, you remember, you worked on that, on that trailer a couple times too, didn't you? You get out there, and I, I slept on the toolbox, though. That's all everybody. One time, one time you go to sleep on the toolbox. 
And you never live it down. You never live it down. I did it. I got sick one day at work. And my uncle to this day said, that boy didn't work. He slept on the toolbox one time, Ronnie, one time. Dad gum. But you know how it went? You get over that cooler, man, and he, oh, and sometimes he had that Gatorade mix too, man. He mixed it in there. Look, I'm starting to get excited about it. Somebody needs to get me some Gatorade powder mix, man. He, he mixed it in there. We had some orange Gatorade, and you get it. Oh, man. And it's hot outside, and you get that cold water, that refreshing cold water. I don't know about y'all, but I, like when I drink a Dr. Pepper, I'm not like my wife. I can't do a lukewarm room temperature Dr. Pepper. Like when it, hits my, I, when it hits my teeth, I like it to hurt a little bit. You know what I'm talking about? It's cold, man. How many of you guys have been blessed and had the revelation of that new coconut Dr. Pepper? Let me see y'all out there. Oh, praise God. God bless Dr. Pepper. If you drink a Coca-Cola, you can get your butt back over to Georgia. You're not wanted here. <laughs> Jamie. Somewhere the other day, she said, I'll take a Coca-Cola and take your butt back to Georgia. What you can do is wake up. <laughs> All right? Into a Coke mess. But, man, I get one Coca, man, I, I, Dr. Pepper. I like that Dr. Pepper good and cold. Man, they even come out for a little while. They had the Dr. Pepper milkshake at Whataburger. Wave at me if you saw the, oh, my Lord. And just like all things, it was for a limited time. All things good for a limited time. Like, why would you do that to me? You messed my whole life up. And that's kind of coconut Dr. Pepper. Kind of tastes like a milkshake in a can a little bit. But I went back up. I was a water burger here a while back. I said, hey, man, you think maybe y'all could make me that nice Dr. Pepper milkshake? And he said, sir, that was for a limited time only. I said, you think maybe you could cheat for me? I'll pay, I'll pay you a little money under the table. He says, sir, we do not have the Dr. Pepper mix for the milkshake anymore. I said, so, but buddy, you got Dr. Pepper? <laughs> yes, sir. Maybe you pour a little Dr. Pepper in a cup and you take pour some ice cream in it and you mix it in a milkshake mixer. Dr. Pepper milkshake. <laughs> Does not compute. <laughs> okay, just get out of the way then, because you ain't leading the following, that's for sure. <laughs> Come on, man. man. See, now I'm going to talk about milkshakes. I'm going to be going over to health camp getting my chocolate peanut butter milkshake. Like I said earlier, 32 ounce, some for now, some for later. <laughs> Am I kidding? I'm going to eat the whole thing at once. But anyways, <laughs> see, I'm talking about some refreshing things. And you, you see, there's things that you like. Like, it's, it's refreshing. And there's something refreshing to God, and it's when people get red hot. And he loves it when he sees cold people walk in the room because he knows the fire of my spirit moving in this room is going to warm you up and you can become something far beyond what you ever thought. But if we're not careful, we become cold and complacent. See, the second thing is that we'll, we'll, for, we'll forget about the call to continuous growth. See, God will take you as you are, but he never leaves you where you were. Philippians 3, 13 through 14 says, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. He said, here I am. I'm the Apostle Paul. I'm writing the epistles. And I still have not quite taken hold of it. See, a lot of people be getting church, and they're in church for a while, and they think, well, this is as far as I go. This is all I need to know. Let me tell you something. The day you stop learning is this day you start dying. And he says right there, he says, I, I don't quite have it yet. He said, but one thing I do Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Verse 14, he says, I press on. Look at your neighbor and say, press on. He said, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Let me tell you something. I'm pressing on because you can go there if you want to, but I'm not going to hell. I'm going to heaven. 
I'm going to make heaven my home, and I'm pressing through. See, we're called to press on, to strive continuous, continuously in growth in our relationship with God. We have to resist the temptation to become complacent and instead pursue spiritual maturity through prayer, studying God's Word. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in this series, in obedience to His commands. I don't have to understand all the whys. If it says it, I'm going to do the what. I know He'll work out the why. I'm not, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have to know. If He said it, then I'm good. See, I, I, everybody's trying to figure God out. Would he be God if I had him all figured out? Like if I could figure him completely out in my finite thinking, and when I tell you my thinking is finite, it is finite. All right, like if I could figure him out, like I'd be in some trouble. I I, kind of want, is he really God? See, there's some things about him that are bigger than my understanding. He knows some things. See, he's the one that created me. He knows what is natural and what is unnatural. He's the one who knows what will bring life to me and what will bring death to me. He knows. And if I stop learning and I stop growing, I'll find myself dying if I'm not careful. I love, I love Sister Tinny. She's one of the sweetest. They, they were learners, man. They were learners to the day Brother Tinny died. He was still learning. And she's still around. She's in her 80s now. And it wasn't just a few years ago. I was at a conference in Alabama. And it was a church growth conference. And we were trying to learn what do, what do we do different, you know, because we want to reach the lost. We're not just here to be a little church over here on this side. We've been here, you see our 100 years? We've been here for 100 years, man. This church has been here. We date back 100 years. If we're still here, there's a reason for it. Come on, do you believe that? If we're still here, it's because God has promised. And I found myself in that. I looked across the room and I saw a little white-haired lady sitting across the room. I said, it cannot be. Do I need to check my glasses? It looks like it is in a room of 8,000 people. I believe it is the one and the only, the original, the mold was broken when he made her the Theodist Tinny. And I looked across, I walked across the room and sure enough, it was Sister Tinny sitting on the second row at a church growth conference. I said, Sister Tinny, what are you doing? in here. What could you possibly have to learn from anyone else? She said, I'm here to learn more, Chris. I'm here to learn more. Well, you, you don't have anything. My goodness, you, you should be up there teaching us. No, no, I got more to learn. Why? She understands if I'm still on this planet, then I got more to learn. Come on. God's not finished with me if I'm still on this planet. The life of a learner, they understand it never stops. It never stops. And we have to keep moving forward. Third thing, if we're not careful, we'll, get, we'll fall in the danger of material comforts. We'll find ourselves in a place where we're just getting complacent and comfortable. I got everything I need. That's the church at Laodicea. I don't need anything else. We'll get to the place where we will be satisfied coming to church, filling a time slot on Sunday, but I don't really have a relationship with God anymore because I'm so comfortable in all of my, and before long you become comfortable in sin. Anybody here ever been comfortable in sin? Bible says sin is fun for a season. And then what does it do? It leads you to death. Heartache, confusion, despair. Oh, man, chaos. And if we're not careful, we wonder what's out of counter in my life. How's your relationship with God? Are you depending on what you have more than who you have? In your life. Luke 12 and 15 says, Then he said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist of an abundance of possessions. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I talk about it all the time. I can just tell you this much. You can have your treasure here if you want to. I want my treasure in heaven. Amen. Come on, I want my treasure in heaven. Fourth thing, if we're not careful, we forget the importance of remaining vigilant. There's a lot of things that could throw you out of kelter in this world today. First Peter 5 and 8 says, be alert in a sober mind. Your enemy, de- the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. I, 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 I was thinking the other day, and I, I really, uh, uh, I heard a preacher preach about it too. I love that he, that he said it. He, you know, we get so focused in, like, how many people do you know that are studying about demons? Like, do you, I've been asked before, oh, Pastor Chris, you, you study demonology. No, I do not. He said, why not? You're a preacher. 
I'm not a preacher of the gospel of Satan. I am a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And here's what I do know about demons, that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. Even they know that Jesus is Lord. See, even they know that he has all authority in the heavens and on the earth. See, even they realize that under the name of Jesus, they have to submit to it. So here's what you need to know about demonology. You ready? Speak the name of Jesus over every situation. Plead the blood of Jesus over every situation. Jesus has all authority in the heavens and on the earth. Come on, man. Do you believe that we serve a God who is still in power and he has already won? He has been triumphant and he's triumphant every single day. That's what you need to know about demons is that they have to submit to the name of Jesus. That's what you need to know. But you got to stay vigilant. Why? Because if I'm not careful and I start walking away from God and I'm not walking in his plan for my life, I start getting into a place where I can be devoured by the enemy. We have to stay vigilant in our faith, recognizing that the enemy seeks to deceive us and distract us from God's truth. See, it's crucial to stay grounded in prayer. In this summertime, don't fall off your prayer. Don't fall off of paying attention to what God is doing we got to surround ourselves with fellow believers for accountability and active, actively resist the temptations that seek to lure, lure us away from God's path. And so today I'm kind of shifting over into the actual series. and I'm going to move fast in closing this part out today. I was studying sheep this week because I was thinking about being a follower. What, what is a good follower? A sheep. Nobody likes being a sheeple. Raise your hand if you're a sheeple. See, nobody. Oh, there's, there's a few people. Okay. Oh, yeah, all right. There we go. But you see, you get what I'm saying. That's why you're raising your hands. Nobody likes being called a sheep. Why? Because a sheep's kind of dumb. It is. So this week, I, I was studying up on sheep because I'd always heard that a sheep will just lay down and die on you if you're not careful, if you, if you don't actually tend to the sheep. And I was thinking, well, that's not altogether true because there's wild sheep too. I mean, I've seen some of those mountain, mountain rams up there. Man, I don't know about y'all, but I want to get on one of those big horn ram hunts sometime. I would love to have one of those big old ram horns, you know, somewhere in an office or something. Man, that, 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 that sounds so fun. But, but, but the, see, the fact of the matter is, is there's a difference between wild sheep and domesticated sheep. Domesticated sheep have been crossbred for a long period, for centuries even, and most of them are grown to produce meat, milk, or to produce wool. The majority of sheep are usually grown to produce wool. If anybody here has wool socks, wave at me right now. It's your favorite socks. Yeah, that's, you, got, you got a wool sweater. Your mama knitted you a couple years ago that shrunk the first time you washed it because you, you washed it hot and you dried it hot. That wasn't, you can't do that, Amen. Uh, like, I, I never, like, I have some wool shirt and line slippers. That's right, I said slippers. You know, I used to be the guy, like, I don't wear no, I don't wear house shoes. I don't need no house shoes. And then a couple years ago, my wife bought me some of those Uggs shirt and line slippers. And let me tell you something. When I get home, the first thing I do is shoes off, slippers on. I found out slippers are nice. Even in the summertime, I like to put those slippers on. There's something about sheep, like, like wool, like if you do the studies on it, like everything has an energy field, and it's actually a positive, like by like 10,000 units energy field. It literally will affect pain in your body. That's why they sell the wool socks, because it's good for you. As a matter of fact, I've worn my slippers so much that I have gone to the store before, standing in the line before, checking out at IGA and Hewitt, and looked down and realized I'm wearing my slippers. Wow. I did that. I'm that dude right now, right? Making sure I actually have shorts on and these are not underwear. Okay, I do have shorts on. We're good. We're good. Right? Like that's one of those that you get so comfortable, right? And I, yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> you had to say it, man. You had to say it. I, I don't have time for it, but now I got to tell the story. Now I got to tell the story. One time I was on a cruise, this right after my wife and I got married, and um, the bathroom door is right beside the door into the hallway. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I get up in the middle of the night to go to the restroom. Huh? 
<laughs> oh, yeah. It happened, y'all. I step out the door into the restroom. I'm preparing to use the restroom when I realize I'm standing in the hallway in my underwear. I turn around and beat on the door, and my wife is so dead asleep that she does not hear me. For five minutes, I beat on the door. She does not come to the door. And I remember there is a phone down in the elevator section, and I can call the room. I sprint down the hallway. Luckily, it's about two or three in the morning. The only people that see me are the workers. In my underwear, on the phone to the room, no answer. Guy walks by me cleaning, he's just going. Uh, how are you? Oh, these are old underwear, sorry, man. <laughs> oh, man, anyways. Story goes, I'm out of the room for 15 to 20 minutes before she finally answers the phone. Goes, Hello? I said, can you let me in the room? She goes, what are you doing out of the room? <laughs> now, by this point, I'm angry. I'm mad at Jamie. She opens the door, lights on. She's mad at me. She's now very awake. What are you doing outside of the room in your underwear? Where have you been? <laughs> this is that moment that I'm not going to explain why. You're just going to have to accept it. So we went to bed and she laid in bed all night looking at me. Anyways, that had nothing to do with the story, but anyways, I had to bring it up. He brought it up. But those Sherlin lime, what well, those wool, they, they feel great. They're so good for you. Why? So those, those lambs, see, those sheep, they're made for producing wool. But the fact of the matter is that a domesticated sheep without a shepherd will literally lay down and die if it is not sheared often and pushed and taken care of throughout the year. They will literally lay down and die. Now, studying, why, why is this that they will lay down and die? Many times the wool will become too heavy on them. The rain will get in it. Uh, parasites and, and all kinds of things will get in that wool. Now, I'm going somewhere with this. You ready? The fact of the matter is is the very thing that they are purposed on this earth for is the thing that will kill them if they do not have the shepherd there to take care of them. Y'all catching on to me. See, a lot of people are trying to walk in God's plan for your life, but you've disconnected from the shepherd and now God's plan for your life and his call on your life has become burdensome. And before long, you, you, you don't realize that you need some shearing. No, I've already grown as much as I need to. No, you need some shearing and just some things need to be cut out in your life. Some change needs to happen in your life so that you can continue to work in the purpose God has called you to. See, I, I'm not the shepherd. He's the shepherd. I know the guy they talk called preachers were shepherds, but I, don't, I like to look at it like this. I'm more like a sheep dog. Now, what is a sheep? My mother-in-law, they have an Australian shepherd. It's a sheep dog, a herding dog. And the, the fact of the matter is, that dog, even when the kids are playing in the yard, you'll watch Gracie, you'll get out there, she'll try to herd the kids up. Why? Y'all all split up. Y'all need to be together. Get together. Right? That dog get out there and push. He, Randy got mad at him, went mad at her one day because he was raising some, some calves and he's proud to put some pounds on them. And he had another 200 pounds to go on their weight gain. And what, what dad coming if Gracie ain't out there chasing calves and now they're going to lose weight because they're chasing calves, right? Why? Because she thinks, hey, you need to move. You're getting too fat and happy. You need to get up and do 
something. And see, I believe God has called preachers all over this world. We're like sheepdogs. Hey, hey, I'm going to keep poking you. I'm going to keep prodding you. Why? Because we got heaven to get to. We're not done moving. We're not done moving. And see, the fact of the matter is, without a shepherd, there is nobody to shear them, and it overtakes them. The purpose overtakes them. It becomes the very thing that will kill them in the long run if they disconnect. And I, I, I don't want to do that. Your purpose is not meant to be too much. And they say, well, God won't put more on you than you can bear. Yes, he will. He put, he'll put more on you than you can bear by yourself. Because when God calls you to do something, there's a stipulation He has to be involved in it. Now this morning, Matthew 28, 19 tells us we're called to go to the world and preach the gospel. We're called, I forsake a time, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you because I don't have a lot of time this morning. We're called to go to the world and preach, not not just some of us, no, his disciples, his followers were called to go to the world. I believe God has put every single one of you on this planet to do the same. 1 John 5 and 3 says, For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. See, if his commandments are burdensome, it's because you're trying to do it in your intellect and you're not doing it in the spirit. And this morning, I want to challenge you as I'm wrapping up today. God has called you to do so. He's called you to be on this planet for a reason. You have a purpose, but you can't do it without him. And if you're finding yourself complacent and getting to a place where you're becoming critical of the kingdom and critical of things, it's usually a good sign that you are no longer serving your purpose on this planet. Like, like I, I wonder, I'm still looking for in the five-fold ministry where the critic is. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see the critic in the five-fold ministry. What, what do you mean? I, I, I love it was, it was actually Teddy Roosevelt that talks about it. It says the points are the, the credit doesn't go to the critic. No, the credit goes to the man in the arena. And some of you are serving God and you're doing great things. You need to learn to tune out the critics and focus on what God has called you to do. Because God is growing you to a place. You ain't going to get it all right. Come on. God is growing you to a place of maturity. One of the best things I was ever told was by, by the, the man who speaks into my life now and is my covering now, and that's by the blessing of my dad. And he told me one time, Morton Buster told me one time, he said, Chris, let me go ahead and get something straight for you. I'd made a decision, and I was calling him, I said, I don't know if it's the right decision. He said, let me just go ahead and clarify something for you, bud. Um, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to be wrong sometimes. Because no leader is always right. See, that's called a dictator, and that's not what you're called to be. You're going to be wrong sometimes and admit when you are. There's nothing wrong with realizing that. I'm going to tell you something. You're going to make some mistakes. Just because you made a mistake doesn't mean God's done with you. But if you're not careful, if you stay in that mistake and you sit in it, you don't move forward from it, you'll get to a place to where you are dying. Ephesians 4.13 says, until we all reach Unity and faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That word mature, it's also said in the King James, it's called perfection or perfect. It doesn't really mean what you think it it totally means. It's actually teleos in the Greek, and it means finished and complete. See, God is finishing you and completing you, but I want to tell you something. It doesn't happen all at once, but it happens over time. Look at your neighbor and say, it happens over time. Don't stop growing. He talks about that fullness and completeness. And this is the pleroma or pleroma, as some would say it in the Greek. And it, this is really, it's that which has been filled. It's like a ship that is being filled. Let me ask you a question. Do you think on those loading docks they roll up there and they just dump everything on the ship at once? No, they put crate by crate on it, 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 one at a time. We got some Navy guys in the room. You know how that goes. That weight's got to be distributed correctly. You don't just dump it all and hope that it all works out. No, you actually plan it out and you do it. See, God is working something. He's loading things into your life one thing at a time. Allow Him to take you from glory to glory, just like His Word says. Is there anybody here that says, you know what, God? I'll take one thing at a time until you grow me into that perfect and complete Christian. 
See, God doesn't dump it all at once. Being a disciple or a follower does not, doesn't happen all at once. No, it happens one step at a time. That's why we call our, our, new, our, our new members class first steps. We don't call it the step and you're done. No, we call it first steps because the goal is for you to continue to grow in your walk with God. Well, I've already read. Let, let, me, let me ask you a question. You come, uh, I've, man, uh, someone told me one time, well, I've exhausted all the classes here. What next? You've been following You've been equipped. Now it's time to lead. Now it's time to live on mission. And that is our goal. Our goal is to see you become a more perfected, a maturing person. But I'm going to tell you something. Just like Paul said, he said, I hadn't quite laid a hold of it yet. We're not quite perfect yet. One day we're going to hear, well done, my good and faithful service. A servant, enter into the kingdom. But I don't want to be the one that hears, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. See, I have to be connected to God. Look at your neighbor this morning and say, God has more. God has more. Ephesians 3 and 20 says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly all the, uh, above all we ask or think, according to the power that works in uh, see, he's the one who has all the authority. He's the one that has the power, but he works in us. The Holy Spirit in us, Paul talks about, he says, that is the Spirit of Christ in you. You need the presence of God working in your life all the time. Well, I, that one time I had an experience with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> one of the kids this week asked, said, hey, hey, does, uh, did, like I had this spiritual experience one time. Do I ever have to do that again? Who was that? It was one one of the kids at camp. They asked, asked, uh, my sister-in-law, Jamie's sister, was telling me about it. Do I ever have to do that again? It's like, why why wouldn't you want to do that again, man? I want to be in the presence of God every single day of my life. 2 Corinthians 3, 16 through 18 says, Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit, I've just preached about this recently, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as a mirror, uh, the glory of the Lord are being transformed. Here's a question I ask our our graduates a couple weeks this. Are you being transformed into the same image? What image? The image of Christ from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. How how you doing? Are you looking like Jesus? Because I don't think Jesus told somebody they were number one in a bad traffic situation. (laughs) My mom has a sticker on the back of her car. Jesus is my lifeline. I said, I wouldn't take that. I wouldn't ride that. And she said, why? She said, I, well, number one, if I accidentally cut somebody off, I don't want them to blame Jesus for it. It wasn't Jesus' fault. It was my fault, right? One guy was walk, working on a car the other day. He walked around. He had his name tag on. It said, Jesus. And he said, I can take the wheel, too. <laughs> it's pretty funny. No, I told her, I said, I wouldn't want that either because, because people, you're going you're gonna to see. And she told me a few weeks later, she said, man, I've been flipped off more times. I said, I know. Am I right? I was right, wasn't I? You get, man, I have, been, I have been told, I said, you know, it's just how you look at it. You can take it offensive if you want to, or you can say, that's right, I am number one. I am number one. Right? I am number one. See, the fact of the matter is, is like how are we acting? Am I looking like the image of Christ? Because when we take the next steps, I experience a few things as I'm wrapping up this morning. Number one thing I experience is a deeper relationship with God. If you're not growing in your relationship with God, you're not in a deeper place, in a more matured place, then you've stopped moving. He says this in 2 Corinthians 3, 16, I read to you a second ago, but I'm going to just read you a couple, make some points off of that passage. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. See, you see, if, if you're feeling like you're distant from God, there are times where God does not speak. That's usually a no. You want an answer for a situation? Well, God didn't. I asked God for an answer. He didn't give me an answer. That means don't move. That means don't walk through that door. Well, Chris, you got to, you know, if you're going to get, you can get somewhere in life, you got to make some things happen for yourself. Sure, you can live that way if you want to, or you can let God make things happen, and you can live in the peace of the Lord. See, a lot of people are looking to be happy, but I want to, be, I want to have peace, contentment, and joy in my life. I keep hearing a line lately from people, work is my church. I mean, if you want that to be your church, you can have it. 
I, I would like to point out the fact that you're worshiping the curse. And you're telling God, I don't need you. Oh, okay, all right, okay, I see how it is. If you, that's how you want it? No, you know what, God, I will provide for myself. I'll miss, I, uh, I'll miss church every Sunday. Come on, come on. I'm struggling just to make $250,000 a year. Can't keep my head above water. You don't have a making problem. You've got a spending problem. <laughs> Why? Because you collect all them earthly possessions. Because you're going to take your treasure here. This is not my home. You, you can keep the earth. I, I like what was it, Davy Crockett. He said, <laughs> he said to Hades, well, y'all, I'm going to Texas. <laughs> Somebody's like, I'm never coming back here. This guy said multiple bad words today. Uh, it's for me, like if you want to, like you can go there, you can choose your reward here on this earth if you want to. I, I'm not interested in it. No, you can go there if you want to, but no, for me and my house, I'm going to heaven. And I'm gonna do it God's way. I'm gonna do it God's way. See, the fact of the matter is, is so many people live, they, they live a complacent life. They, they live life and it's not to the fullest. They got a bunch of stuff, but they're not happy. The reason they're not happy is because they're not serving their true purpose on this planet. God did not put me here to entertain myself. I'm not here to be entertained. I'm here for a purpose. Second thing of this is, is that when we take those next steps, we experience a life of freedom. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 says, Now the Lord, the Lord is spirit. And what does it say? We all know this. I quote it all the time. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But see, we think liberty is living with no boundaries. Liberty is living the way I want to live. We are so rich and increased with goods in the United States that we focus on things that do not matter. Like people spend hours a day with their fantasy football teams. They spend hours a day keeping up with local sports stuff. And like at the end of the day, like really, I remember we were in Rome and I was, I was thinking that we went and saw the Colosseum and I'm standing there in front of the Colosseum and I said, man, man, these people, man, this is, this is crazy. And, and it was for stuff that didn't even, it doesn't even matter at the end of the day. They were killing Christians in this thing. Man, man, I'm so glad we don't live that way. And then I got home and I was realizing, man, we build these stadiums that seat 120,000 people just to come watch some fat dudes run around sweat on each other for... I mean, like, seriously, these are professional athletes, and you watch an offensive lineman run off the field, and he's like. <laughs> we're not worried about his 40 time. We're worried about that, that step. You've got to get that step right. That's what we're worried about. Like, at the end of the day, like, like he, he's a good blocker. That, that's great. I mean, that's, I do, if, if that, that's awesome. I, I love, I, I do, I love football. I really do love football. But, but, but at the end of the day, like, like really, like, uh, sports, like all these things, like, this is all we're focused on. And I think that's great. But what if I serve what God called me to do in that mix in the process? Right? Because you're here for so much more than those things. We focus more on what so-and-so did. You know, I'm, I'm about to say it. Oh, God, I'm going to get in trouble. I'm going to go ahead and get ready to hide real quick. They have linked. Oh, God, Jamie, I'm going to get, somebody's going to shoot at me. They have linked people who keep up with tabloids and the latest gossip of celebrities with low IQ. Jesus, name. Did y'all know that? Like, like that, I don't know about you. Like, so, when I read that, I was like, I, I, I unfollow that one, unfollow that one, unfollow that one. I don't have a low IQ. <laughs> like, really, like, we're, we're focused on stuff that, that like, it, it, is it possibly that we're unhappy in our lives so we're looking for other people that are unhappy to justify why I feel unhappy in my own life? And this morning, I'm, come on, man, I, I gotta, I'm, I'm hustling. But this morning, I wonder how many of us, like, we, we focus on this. We, we have no boundaries. We, have, we, we just live any, it, why, why did you make all those points? Because now we're focused on things like my rights. Like, I have rights to things that at the end of the day are privileges. But we think we have a right to it because we're so successful. that We think everybody is supposed to have that. Like, we, we, in America, do you realize... We're one of the only nations in the world 
that has overweight homeless people. No, seriously, overweight homeless people. I've been to countries and seen, some of you have also been there, and you see that people are starving in the streets because they can't, but we, 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 that's how we start getting to places where we think, well, I have a right to this, or I have a right to that, or I have a, I have a, you know, I, that, that I should be able to have that also. No. See, we think freedom is living the, with my own boundaries, not just no boundaries, but my own. No, I'll choose what my boundaries are. See, true freedom is living inside God's boundaries. Because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Third one, as our musicians come back, I'm wrapping up. Third thing is this, is when we continue to take the next steps, we find ourselves in a role in God's mission. We find ourselves working in something that is bigger than us. He said in 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says, But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Just as by the Spirit of the Lord. First, Second Corinthians says this in 4, 3 through 5 says, But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. But Chris, I, I'm not getting anything from church anymore. Are you perishing? That's a true question. Are you perishing? Because the Bible says for us to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. And I wonder today how many people, like if we're not careful, according to the summertime, we can fall behind to a place where we're dying, just like a sheep without a shepherd. We're not following the good shepherd, the one true shepherd, that being Jesus Christ. I'm not truly following in what he has called me to do. Why? Because I, I lead my own life. I make decisions for myself. I, don't, I know the Bible says that, but I don't think it's necessary. I don't want to be that person. He says, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, least the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. He said, for we do not preach ourselves, Christ this morning. I, I don't preach myself. I don't even preach that I'm the shepherd. I know a lot of preachers, well, we refer to that in scriptures under shepherds. No, no, I don't even, I don't even deserve this morning. No, he is the shepherd. I, I can only be an example when I exemplify him. Mom, dad, the only way you can be an example to your kids is when you exemplify Jesus. He says, let's the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is in the image of God should shine on them for we do not preach ourselves but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your bond servants as you stand all over the room this morning for Jesus' sake in the second part of 2 Corinthians 3 and 18 he said and the Lord who is the spirit makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image can we close our eyes all over the room this morning as we're wrapping up I wonder if there's someone here this morning who says, you know what? My eyes closed everywhere, not looking around. You know what? Maybe I've, maybe I've been falling a little further behind than I need to. Maybe I've been slipping a little bit. If that's you this morning, I wonder if you just slip a hand up and be honest with me for a second. Just say, you know what, dude? I, I, need to get, I need to get close to Jesus. Come on, that's beautiful. Anybody else? Come on, this is a repentance moment. Nobody's looking around. Just you and me for a minute. Good, good, good. Now I wonder... Can we all lift our hands up with those in the room right now? Come on, because if you're not growing your backside, I want to tell you this morning, God does not want you there. And this is not the time to fall behind. But I want to encourage you today, allow God to do what God wants to do in your life as your hands are lifted. God, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for your spirit that is in this room. I just ask you right now, God, let your spirit flow in all of us throughout this room. Have your way in our lives. God, we are asking you today, God, let your conviction set in our lives. We're asking you, chasten us, God, through this week. God, grow us through this week. The real change is happening Monday to Saturday, and we know that it is in our personal time with you, God.
God. I pray that you would lead us and guide us in your pathways of righteousness. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Come on, if you agree with me on that, can we say it in Jesus?